Viking martial arts. There is a ton of media and research out there depicting how the Viking actually engage in combat, but how much of it is accurate? We have two very special guests joining us, Dr. William Short and Rainier Oskarsson. Together, they represent the organization Hersvik, as well as co-authored the book Men of Terror, a comprehensive analysis of Viking combat. Now, these guys have done some serious research, and they're going to challenge everything you knew about the Vikings. And today, they're going to share what they uncovered in a decades-long research project and tell us a little bit more about the real Viking martial arts. So I'd like to start off, first of all, by thanking you gentlemen so much for taking your time to join us in this chat and share your research with us about Viking uh, combat. And, you know, we're going to get to more into details of the actual combat itself. But first, um, I'd like to start from the beginning. Can you tell us what Hurstvik is and what is the goal of the organization? Hurstvik is an organization that researches Viking combat. You know, we're interested in all things Viking, but our main focus is Viking combat. We're trying to understand as deeply and as carefully as possible uh, how it was that Vikings fought. I really have no martial arts background. Uh, my background is technical, and I worked in a job where I was working on uh, audio, acoustics, human hearing. And I read these things called sagas, these stories set in Viking Age Iceland. And I read one and liked it, read a few more, really liked it, and decided to learn more by taking a summer course at the University of Iceland. That was 25 years ago. When I got back, I really wanted to do more. And I found this group called Hurstwick that was starting to just get formed. And they put me in charge of uh, the, the weapons training because they just had a very serious injury. And I wanted to make sure they didn't do that. And so no one was really doing this kind of research um, that long ago. Uh, there was really nothing. But I did find uh, a local museum, the Higgins Armory Museum, that had quite an extensive medieval and Renaissance collection of, of arms and armor. And they were just starting a group that was basically doing HEMA research, historical European martial arts, uh, so based on some of the manuals. And I thought that was at least a starting point. And that's really where Herstrick started. Eventually we separated, we got our own training room, and uh, the focus has really been on uh, Viking weapons and Viking combat. Oh, I'll add a little bit to it. Uh, so first, the question of uh, what is Hurstwick? Uh, we are just uh, really peculiar super nerds. Uh, really interested <laughs> in some strange, strange science. Uh, what was it, about 12, 13 years ago? Uh, yes. I met William by mere chance. I had no interest in Vikings at all, and he poisoned me polluted my brain and it, somehow it took over. I was a martial artist before, uh, but Vikings just, it, it became too fascinating to research it. Yeah, I just turned into a nerd. I probably was never cool, but I turned into a nerd. Now you mentioned that you were a martial artist prior. Um, what arts did you study and how did that affect your perspective going into this project? I dabbled in many things, but uh, my main focus was Taekwondo, Kondo, and uh, I played a little bit with uh, mixed martial arts artists as well and what i saw especially was um when i st uh, so i came from traditional background and into something else uh, it, it started with the cheat control where it really broke the pattern of how you should think somewhat different than the traditional martial arts as in they had a goal and their um their method was just to attain their goal now in their own way and then i went to uh, mixed martial arts as well but nothing nothing serious or, or or important, but they had a different goal and they tried to attain that goal differently. So they broke the pattern of how you should do things. And uh, that's what I would say I brought to the table of her story. Studying medieval martial arts, specifically Viking combat, had been a path uh, that many had gone before me, but I had no connection with it. I just saw, okay, that's the goal. How do we attain that goal? And William was a scientist, so I thought, no, no, we'll use your scientific background. We don't need to go a path that somebody else has gone. As if Vikings weren't already badass enough, it's worth highlighting an elite and even more intense warrior, the Berserker. Meaning bearskin, these warriors were frenzied, wore animal skins, and utilized intimidation tactics such as chewing on their shields. In recognition of this history, we have added the Viking Berserker warrior into our Colors of Combat shirt collection. If you enjoy the content on our channel, we invite you to our website to check out this and 22 other colorful art designs. We thank you all so much for your support and for helping us to continue making these episodes. Are there any other key players in the organization that we should know about? 
Yeah, certainly we have a range of instructors in our organization who have uh, reached some level of competency in this, not only in the in the in the art combat arts, but also in terms of the research and uh, what they have accomplished. When we got this uh, core group, um, they had specialities that uh, were immensely important to us. So one of them was a special forces soldier, so he could tell us this is not how combat is done or this is the difference between modern combat what i would do and what vikings would do and we hit that point very often it doesn't matter what we would do because we have to figure out what they would do and that is a uh, uh, totally different and i have a prop next to me i hope you can see it so this one here for example it's a it's a axe that we made specifically for our uh, research purpose we wanted an axe that we could hit with and would uh, leave impact, but no bones broken. And we could hook with as well. So it's made from uh, yeah, whatever material our maker, Barbara Vector, uh, made it from. But she made it specifically so we could do research. And we had to invent a lot of training tools and apparatus to do our research. Mm -hmm. We are super nerds, Dan. I, 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 oh, I assume that comes clear. Yeah. Oh, that is awesome. That that's even better. And I definitely want to get back to the weapons because there's there's a whole fascinating aspect to that. How you guys approach that. But um, one of the things I want to ask right now is, um, when you started this project, what led you believe that there was um, aspects to Viking martial arts that hadn't already been established? When I met William uh, these uh, what, 13, 14 years ago, I attended one of his lectures. Again, not interested in Vikings at all, and I thought uh, this doesn't make sense. So I live in Iceland. Uh, this is the place where uh, the, the stories were kept, where the uh, culture was kept. Not that it wasn't kept in Denmark, Sweden, Norway and so on, but it was just uh, uh, intently kept here. I've been hit in the nose before. So what I saw William do is I thought, oh, everybody has a plan until they're hit in the nose. And uh, that's sort of what I saw William was doing at that time. So I, I questioned it. Yeah, he, Rainer brought reality to what we were doing. I mean, up until that point, it was mostly book learning with some, and correct me if I'm wrong, but mostly book learning with time spent in the training room. But none of us have been, you know, basically punched in the nose. So Rainer brought that level of seriousness and uh, and experience with other arts to what Hearst was, was doing and brought us up to a whole new level in our research and a whole new level in our training. Can you tell us what the I-33 manuscript is? Sure, it's the Royal Armory's uh, I-33 manuscript. Uh, it's thought to have been written in what is now the northern parts of Germany in around the 12th century, 13th century, 13th century, I think, early 13th century. And it covers using sword and buckler. And many people believe that it's a good basis for doing Viking sword and shield. You know, pretty quickly, Dan, we, we had to drop that because the weapons really are so different. A buckler is nothing remotely li not like a shield. And that really got confirmed for us by a passage in Eastlendinga Saga, one of the Sertlunga sagas that are contemporary histories. And the author of that saga actually participated in a lot of the fights he describes. And he writes about swords and bucklers being used in the same fight in Iceland in that time, which was what, 13th century. And he clearly describes a buckler being used the way a buckler is used, and he clearly describes a, sword, uh, a shield being used in the way that a Viking shield would be used. So at least at that point, they understood the differences between the two weapons and understood that they were used very, very differently. You know, so with that backing up our practical tests in our training room, uh, we really had to discard using not only I-33, but pretty much all the manuals. They are all much too late to be very useful to us. As we uh, did our research, we found out that there are three pillars to understanding Viking combat. And one of those pillars is mindset. And that goes for every fighting system. And I will give you an analogy from uh, medieval Japan. If I took uh, uh, two, two warriors, a ninja and a samurai, and I, I asked them to fight to the death, noon tomorrow, uh, high noon. Uh, the clothes will put new clothes on and you will receive a weapon you've never seen before so i give them uh, a tommy gun and a three-piece suit at noon the day after the 
I can sort of guarantee you the samurai will be standing really proud and uh, tall on a hill, stating his clan, stating issuing the challenge, while the ninja would just uh, rat -tat 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 in the back of his head. So that is the mindset, and mindset dictates behavior. So we had to dig really deep into the mindset. Uh, we use a concept called, uh, we, we coined uh, narrow sources. So narrow sources means the, the source must be about Vikings. Uh, the manuals might be really good for many, many things, but to us, um, they're not about Vikings. So and I saw on your site that you mentioned that you had to take the stance of separating contemporary martial arts ideals and mindsets and combat styles from what would the historical um, sources would be. How did you go about making that division between the two? Uh, when I when Will, William dragged me into the organization, I was super scared because I could see uh, that William really was a genius. He really knew what he was talking about. Super clever human being. I was just really scared that anything I would put to the table would be polluted. Strikes like uh, uh, something from a Japanese art or, or suddenly they would be doing uh, spin kicks from Taekwondo or who knows what. <laughs> it would be really easy to pollute it, really easy. We agreed. Instead of using some martial arts, I would use maybe training methodology or testing methodology from martial arts. But at any technical aspect or movement aspect or something, we would refrain from. Uh, when we were doing our simulated combat, we saw opportunities to give a punch or a headbutt or a knee. Really luckily, we asked the question, did Vikings hit? Did they punch? Did they headbutt? Did they knee? And the really short answer is no, they didn't. What makes most sense to me has no relevance to what makes most sense to Vikings. And that comes back to the mindset. If you understand the mindset, then you can start to uh, see how they thought. And that's a perfect segue into your sparring experiments. I really enjoyed reading about the different stages of sparring that you guys do and how you consider that the laboratory for this project. So can you tell us a little bit how, how you guys approach sparring and how that plays into your research of how the Vikings combated? We call it... Uh dynamic combat uh, simulation or force of force simulation. Now there is a big problem. What we are researching is sharp blade combat. And we really need to respect that that's what we're testing and uh, researching. So our approach to the simulations was to understand that there's a missing part and try to uh, make a holistic picture by doing it in many different ways. So we would use um, super light weapons because then you would get the sort of uh, the correct biomechanics and they could uh, punish you so hard that you don't like to be hit that hard but then we would use steel weapons and you know when you have a two-handed steel axe you'll have to pull back you'll have to pull back on the strike otherwise either i'm trying to injure you or you will be wearing so much protection that we're going back to this is not how a strike was done because you're wearing so much protection. It would not have the same effect on you. It changes the dynamics. A shield against a blunt weapon usually doesn't break. So we created uh, fake shields that would break to a blunt weapon so we could get the same dynamics in the fight. So we had to just, um, when there was a part missing, we tried to add it in by changing some element in the, in the simulation itself. Yeah, to answer the question, we just had to do crazy many things and crazy different things uh, using the scientific method, which means we try to falsify our theory. We say, didn't Vikings do this? And then we try to falsify it. And we do that by having massive amount of different uh, tools. Maybe one of Herstrick's great strengths is our ability to improvise on that and create training weapons. If we want to do an experiment and we don't have a training weapon that seems like it's going to be safe, that seems like it's going to replicate something that the Vikings used and seem to have the right capabilities, not only offensive capabilities, but also defensive capabilities. So it's going to react in many of the same ways. If we don't have that weapon, we'll try to make something. So Barber's axes are the perfect example of that. Uh, we needed an ax that we could hit with uh, and not break bones or kill people. And Barbara came up with something that was really clever, and it has that necessary defensive element of actually being able to hook, uh, a use of the axe that Vikings took advantage of, hooking people, hooking shields, hooking other things. But one of my favorite 
exercises that we did with these sorts of improvised weapons, you know, sometimes weapons break during a fight. And so I had rigged up a whole bunch of weapons, which unknown to the participants in that day's training would break very easily. So they thought they were just normal weapons, but they were rigged so that they would break. And it was funny, you know, one person's spear broke in the middle of a, a round and it took them a minute before they realized they had only half a spear left. Because people get so excited, so into the into the fight. So, how did these sparring? Uh, tell us about how um, these sparring sessions progressed from just being indoor in the laboratory and actually outside into the weather and the elements of different trains. How did that add more dimension to your research? Outdoor simulations they gave us new view because we could test new scenarios and yes. uh, we could test an ambush, uh, hiding if needed to, ideas about the footwork. You know, most often combat training is trained. Uh, indoors on an even floor and outdoors that doesn't happen very often if you if you at least in the viking age but uh, we had the basic sort of down how they fought so this would be just a slight adaptation and i will add an example of that you know one of the environmental situations that we set up to spar on was on board a viking ship and I remember, I didn't think it would matter that much, but wow, what a difference, the rocking deck of a ship. And combine that with all the stuff that is on the deck of a ship that gets in the way of a fight, um, really changed the dynamics of the fight and opened our eyes to how complex that could be. Fascinating. I, I love the authenticity to your approach because it's, it's more than just reading a few passages, reading some textbooks and coming up with a theory. You guys are actually out there testing and testing and being as authentic as possible. And Rainier, I know you told me about um, something about you guys were the first people in 700 years to make iron like actually out in the elements. Could you tell us about that and how that changed history? Yeah, we got, Dan, we're interested in everything related to Vikings, not just combat. And one thing that fascinated us is the iron. Uh, you know, how iron was made in Viking Age Scandinavia, people have been studying that, that's pretty clear. But what was really interesting was how was iron made in Viking Age Iceland? And I think Reiner can confirm this, but for decades, if not longer, Everyone has believed that the iron made in Viking Age Iceland was just utter crap, uh, that swords made out of this stuff would bend during a fight, and you'd have to straighten it out underfoot, and it's, that's uh, something that appears in the sagas a couple of times. And So the general belief was that this stuff was just rubbish. But then, I don't know, a few years ago, uh, I was visiting some friends in Iceland, and we visited this, this site, uh, and there were these mountains of iron slag there from the Viking Age. And I looked at the archaeological report, and this this farm made something like 1,000 tons of iron in the Viking Age. I mean, that's way more than the farm needs, way more than the district needs, way more than that quarter of Iceland needs. What were they doing making all that iron if it was really crap? And uh, that was only one of multiple sites that made lots of iron in Viking Age Iceland. So we were curious. What was the quality of Viking Age uh, iron in Iceland? So we decided to start a research experiment to find out. And we brought in a whole bunch of experts, uh, like geologists that could tell us about uh, the raw materials available in Iceland. And we needed high temperature experts who could tell us about uh, the necessary materials for making the, the furnace where the smelting takes place. And we had wood experts in the Forestry Service of Iceland helping us out, and uh, probably others that I can't even remember at this point. And we put it all together. We did this research. We tried to use the scientific method to understand it. And we did a whole lot of smelts here in the United States, uh, basically to, to, to get the fundamentals so that we understood the basics. And then we went to Iceland. We had a festival. We used all Icelandic materials and made good quality iron. And we think it was probably the first iron made in Iceland in many centuries, probably 700 years. And importantly, the thing that that you know broke everyone's mind was this wasn't just good iron this was excellent iron this iron was more than adequate for pretty much any tool any weapon that you might want to make it was first quality iron and so we sort of rewrote history by doing this experiment i often hear glima associated with uh, with viking combat how much does that actually play into to your research and how like how authentic is that to their method of fighting so First of all, then uh, be super careful of the internet. There is so much rubbish nonsense about Glima flying around everywhere. Either check what we have done, uh, which has been uh, uh, recognized by the Glima Association of Iceland, 
the only authority of, on Klima, or go directly to them, klima.is. We started taking our, our uh, resources together and put them in a book, in a book form. I wanted all the highest authorities to check them out, to falsify them, to, to, to tell us, no, no, this is wrong. So one of the uh, authorities I went to is the Klima Association of Iceland. Uh, and Klima, just for your audience, if they don't know, Klima is the wrestling method of Vikings and the empty-handed combat method of Vikings and today is the national sport of Iceland. And we have an association of, of uh, Klima here in Iceland. So I went to them, went to their president and I just fell in love with it. Uh, there is a direct lineage uh, from the Viking age till the day to day. There, there is evolution, there is changes, but there is a direct lineage and it is, uh, yeah, it has, it had immense influence because it is a direct lineage and we can train it today and we can speak to the people. And uh, so it's a living combative activity of Vikings. So if you understand the gleam of today, you can walk down the path all the way to the gleam of the past. And if you understand the gleam of the past and the gleam of the day, then it's really easy to look at, um, let's say a sword strike and say, no, this does not fit into this holistic picture because in I think in every single culture, armed combat and unarmed combat go hand in hand. Oh, absolutely. And I love that you shared some photos with me. You were doing some uh, some grappling on ice. Um, I love, again, another aspect that a lot of people probably don't think about, but what was that experience like and how did that add to your research? We do research and we admit to being super nerds in Viking combat. And that means we have to do many scary, scary things. Like... Uh, where you think, what the hell is going to happen now? Is something going to break or am I going to drown? And this was one of those experiments. So uh, we we entered a, a ice rink with uh, wrestling shoes on and they are um, in some ways very similar to uh, Viking shoes. And we did Glima. Uh, I took uh, one of the best Glima uh, fighters in Iceland and uh, yeah, just had them try to heal me gently. And uh, I'm still alive today. <laughs> I don't know how. But it is super scary. And we know that, uh, and I did this because, uh, again, everything must fit. It must be a holistic image. So sword strike must fit with the uh, with the klima. The klima must fit with the mindset. Now, if we say, uh, if we find out that they did klima on ice, and that does not fit with the klima we know, then we know something is off. So that's why we had to do it, because we know in the Viking is the klima on ice. And I think the last source I have found of doing Glima on ice is uh, 1900s. But we have done scary things before and it doesn't make me any more manly or courageous, just makes me scared every single time. So this holistic approach you're talking about, this is a holistic image of the way they would have fought in authentic combat. There was a quote on, on, on the website where you mentioned that you wanted people to be able to look outside through a window into the room and see you guys wrestling and forget about the weapons or forget about the, 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 the costumes that you're wearing and look at it and go, okay, yes, that's Viking combat. How, what did you find in your research that makes that kind of distinction? How was Viking combat different from other types of martial arts? If you looked in the window and saw two people I don't know, dressed in Boy Scout uniforms, hitting each other with a stick, you would know they were Viking fighters because of the way that they were moving, the way that they were using those tools. And that's what we're trying to do in our training room. And it has to do with the mindset. And I think it's the third pillar that we're talking about, that it's all power-based. It's a, a power-based uh, activity. And the goal of a Viking fight is simply split into whatever is in front of you. And so if they are doing something that involves a tap or a jab or some low power attack, we're probably going to say, no, that's probably not how Vikings would have done it because everything points to this power based uh, attack. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you, I'll give you a little bit, uh, a, little bit more, a little bit more of the same, the same point of view. And I won't go real deep into it. There are three pillars of understanding Viking carpet. One is Klima. And Glima is a power-based system. It is about who is the strongest, that you take down your opponent. And uh, in Icelandic, we still have in, in common phrases, uh, that means you throw him down and you, you take a, a superior uh, ground position to finish him off. It is just get it down, finish it. 
Then we have the idea of the mindset, and that's a little bit complex, so I'll give you just a, the, the, the short version. That is about two things. It's about, uh, uh, number one is about Orstir, and Orstir means word glory. It means that your, uh, that your name is spoken after your death. It is the eternal life. And how do you get that word glory? Uh, you do that by being a drengur. And a drengur is not easily trans translatable a word. It means uh, uh, it is sort of trust-infused honor. And the third pillar is uh, adaptability and improvisational skills, like in the use of rocks. It use what you have. So the idea is you uh, take down what is in front of you with group power. Just cleave it into, and that makes sense because then people will talk about you. But when when Dan slew the the ogre William and the, this evil bastard drained it. He cut them in two, and then, and then he broke William's back. People will talk. And that's what was the key, important. Then you must be a man who is to be trusted. So you don't do anything underhanded. You don't sort of uh, assassinate me or anything like that. So there's a difference between killing and murdering in, in, in uh, Viking mindset. Uh, killing someone, that is okay. You're ready to take the consequences. You killed someone and claimed the kill. Murdering someone means you did it in a secret, you didn't tell anybody, and that is the lowest of the low. So you partially answered my question with this, because I was going to ask another question. I was uh, looking at some of your research about the, that heavy chopping blow with the axe, these heavy axes, and looking at the photos of the Viking with the axe up in the air coming down for that swing, what I couldn't help notice was how vulnerable they looked in that moment. So when, when they were doing those kind of maneuvers, did they have any specific defensive tactics to kind of protect themselves? Or was it all risk be damned? Or were these more just finishing moves? That did they not even care about the defensive side of that? Uh, you, have to, you have to look at it from a different eye than the eye of uh, a typical uh, martial artist today who knows like this is first happening, then this, and you need to be prepared for this. Are they vulnerable? Yeah, it's a, it's a big axe, but... Our research also says that it is a meteor. It takes away anything that goes in front of it. So the psychological uh, element of what the hell is happening with this big blade coming at me, it's not like, yeah, I'm tactical thinking because here in our Zoom meeting, we can assume many things. Yeah, we'll do this and this and this. But when a 200 axe is coming at you at full speed, eh, if your pants are clean, I mean, that's good enough. You die an honorable death. And the other thing that I would add to that is you know, I saw that picture, and I think I know which picture you're talking about. And there's quite some distance between them. So Mike has all the advantage of, of range that, against Barbara's sword and shield. And Barbara can put her shield up, but the axe is going to go right through that, right through her helmet and right through her head. You know, we've done those tests. <laughs> what about any uh, empty hand fight, like striking arts, uh, punches, kicks? Did they have anything distinctive about the way they fought uh, empty handed? Uh, our sources all point to they did not strike. Uh, if they st if they struck, the, uh, then it was in anger or or um, out of control situations. And my theory was uh, why didn't they strike? But the bones of the hands are, are fragile, and this is a weapon based system. So you can imagine if you have to use your handgun day in and day out, or you have to always be prepared to use it, even though you don't use it day in and out, and then you break your hand. Then things are not as easy. This is your safety of life. So uh, uh, that was my theory, at least. Um, and that's only a theory because I see nothing about it, but I see they didn't punch, really. Uh, about their uh, their fighting style was most uh, mostly just uh, power based in uh, get a grip around the lower back of the opponent, and then you continue on from there. You might sweep his leg, you might break his back, you might lift him up and crash him down. And from there, they would, uh, if that didn't do the job, and if this was combat, because they had supportive glima, uh, and they had combative glima, and they are nearly identical, apart from the intensity of the throw itself, and the follow-up, which is this uh, uh, superior ground fighting position. And please remember, this is like caveman Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Like, uh, <laughs> uh, it was the, uh, a brutish, uh, power-based, uh, honor-based uh, system about eternal life that people want to talk to you forever because you are a warrior. What was the role of the knife and why did the Vikings consider themselves unarmed even when they had one? 
I'll try to answer that. We don't think that they considered the knife to be a weapon. I mean, that was sort of the last resort. Everyone carried a knife on their belt all the time or around their neck. And if you truly had nothing else, um, the knife would have to do as the weapon. Or it might be the finishing weapon once you had the superior ground position. But the, the typical weapons would be, you know, sword, axe, spear, sax, uh, things like that. And the, the knife would just be your everyday tool. So a tool more than a weapon. Uh, my theory is that um, weapons had single purpose. So you have the you have the axe, the normal everyday wood axe or axe for whatever. And that makes a wet shape like this. So if you stick it into a wood, you can pull it back out. As an example of a, a tool axe, the weapon axe was really thin, and if you cut wood with it, it would just get stuck. But if you cut a limb with it, it was perfect. So I, I think the knife was a so multi-purpose tool, but I think the weapons were pure weapons. So at this point, um, all your research has led to you guys releasing your new book, Men of Terror. Um, what are some interesting things that readers can expect to learn about in this book? What was most interesting to me and where things sort of fell into place and started really making sense is when we came to this realization of these three pillars that define Viking combat. And once someone has an understanding of what those three pillars are, how they combine and, and what it all means, then the general concept of what Viking combat is all about really falls into place and makes a lot more sense. The other aspect that's in the book is there's just this really wide and deep scientific research going on. So the book has not only got the photographs of the weapons, photographs of some of the moves, but a lot of scientific data. So graphs and plots uh, of some of our tests that uh, help support some of our ideas about how the fighting was conducted. Did you encounter any resistance at all from the academic community when you started this project? And how any pushback towards what people thought they knew about Vikings? Yeah, Dan, yes and no. So the no part first. First of all, it seems like a lot of what we do is somewhat under the radar in the academic field. And yes, we get a lot of pushback once people are aware of what we're doing, um, which I think Renner can probably talk about much better than I can. Uh, As you, I assume, know, in the martial arts circle, uh, ego is rampant. But later on, I learned that uh, uh, a lot of the Viking world, especially, uh, has just uh, is more vibrant than, with uh, ego than even the martial arts. So, with the academics, no, they didn't pay much attention to us in the beginning and uh, brushed aside in the beginning. Now that has changed quite a lot, I must admit. And, and I respect that. I mean, we do not come from the academic field of Vikings, but still we are uh, respected and accepted by, by many academics now. Now, uh, those who don't know us, of course not. Uh, they, they assume that we just dress up and uh, pretend to be Vikings. So where is your research taking you now? What are your next steps in this project? Ah, uh, Dan, that could be the basis of another one hour chat. Uh, we have a lot of interesting projects uh, on tap. I'll talk about one that's really got me fascinated and it's it's pretty nerdy and that has to do with the physics of Viking weapons. Truly understanding how it is that the warrior moves to move his weapon such that the weapon hits the target and delivers destructive energy. And uh, we've started on that. Several phases are now well underway in that. So for instance, we've done motion capture of, of uh, hitting, striking with uh, Viking weapons to understand exactly how the warrior's body is moving and where the power is coming from and when it is being delivered and, and how it all comes together to that one point where weapon hits target and how much energy is put into the target. And we started doing like 3D scans of Viking weapons. So we have excellent models of these uh, historical Viking weapons to use in our modeling. So it's still underway. It's still ongoing, but we're excited about where it may end up. So if viewers were only going to take one idea and walk away with one idea from this video, what would you want that idea to be? <laughs> yeah, the idea would probably be in all realms, be that in martial arts, be that in researching Vikings, be that in uh, studying anything or interacting with a human being at all. There is no reason to do something just because somebody said so. You should look for falsifying, especially if you're learning uh, uh, especially with the martial arts, and, and and that is the school I come from. So that is the school I see uh, that has uh, influenced the martial art as well, That uh, because the instructor told me, therefore. And you think, no, 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 we use the falsifying process where we test it and so on and so forth, and he should, well, the data is here. Or 
something of those lines. And Dan, I come from a, a background, a technical background, and the scientific method is is uh, ingrained into into my whole being. And I think what we discovered is that science can be applied to any of this stuff, including Viking combat. And by applying science to our research in Viking combat, we can make startling breakthroughs, uh, really understand this in ways that it has not been understood before. And so using the scientific method in places where you wouldn't think the scientific method would apply has been very valuable to us. It just is too interesting and too much fun. I had no idea that uh, martial arts could be so adventurous where you can just test things and test things in the most open way possible like i told you uh doing gleam on ice or or jumping from uh a deep end of a swimming pool in a chamber checking if you can swim it's just uh, it somehow brings uh, the quickness to your heart yeah, well I, I personally had a blast reading through your website like when, when you when we first talked about it you know i thought this would be interesting just you know get some concepts of the martial arts but when i really saw the type of experiments you were doing and and the lengths you were going to to make it as authentic as possible it it opened up a lot of ideas that i never even thought to think you know if that mm -hmm. makes any sense is that there's so many so much things to look at and i just absolutely admire what you guys have done and, and the work you've put into it and just like you said falsifying everything and make you know you're holding everything up to a standard and then you're recreating a new standard and holding everything up to that so i think that's extremely admirable um i think it's fantastic research i cannot wait to see what you guys do next this is this is <laughs> fascinating thank you dan so that was a peek into the world of viking martial arts I would like to thank William and Rainier today for their time and for sharing their passion and knowledge with us. Their book, Men of Terror, a comprehensive analysis of Viking combat, goes into much greater detail and I highly recommend picking up a copy. It helps support the research and you can find a link to the book down below in the description. Now, if you're interested in breaking common narratives and learning true history, then let's talk about the real origin and history of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. BJJ and MMA competitor Robert Drysdale joins us and he challenges everything you think you know about the art.